Good morning, church, and welcome to everyone who is uh, here today. Jeff Corey, you are to be commended for your first time doing a Zoom lesson. Uh, that was fantastic, and I thank you so much for your passion and uh, your zeal with which you presented that. Um, I want to talk with all of you a little bit today about the idea of anxiety. And I just want to ask you, have you ever met someone or known someone who is just controlled by worry? That everything to them is all about worry. Um, they, they're fearful of being in a, in a car wreck, so they don't go get in a car. They're fearful that they won't have enough food, and so they hoard up all sorts of stockpiles of food. Um, the, the hypochondriac who's fearful of getting any type of germ, and so they just keep themselves inside the whole time. That's actually sort of like what we're all doing right now. But you can sort of see, you, maybe you've met somebody that was like that, that you would say their worries are just sort of unjustified, uh, that, that there's just so much that is out of control. But what about us? Have you ever worried? I would imagine that all of us over these past few weeks have worried quite a bit. And there's a tendency for us to justify our anxieties to rationalize our worries. We can give it whatever reason, X, Y, Z, but we, we tend to say, you know, it's, it's okay for me to be worried and have anxiety about this. But I want you to sort of think about that and, and let's look at what Jesus said this morning. And hopefully when we come to the end of this, we can find then, okay, how can we better deal with our anxiety. So if you have your Bibles, if you would turn to Matthew chapter 6. To Matthew chapter 6, and we're going to talk about what about worry. So Matthew chapter 6, and I'm going to be reading there beginning in verse 25. So there it says in verse 25, for this reason I say to you, do not be worried about your life as to what you will eat or what you will drink, nor for your body as to what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air, that they do not sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not worth much more than they? And who of you, by being worried, can add a single hour to his life? And why are you worried about clothing? Observe how the lilies of the field grow. They do not toil, nor do they spin. Yet I say to you that not even Solomon, in all his glory, clothed himself like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the furnace, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? Do not worry then, saying, what we, will we eat, or what will we drink, or what will we wear for clothing? For the Gentiles eagerly seek all these things. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. So do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will take care of itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Now, kids, all of you who are listening, you actually can probably help your family learn this lesson way better than anybody else because you've already gone over it, especially if you're in the fourth and fifth grade classes and all the way down from there to the, to the, uh, the, the younger classes because we've already studied this passage this quarter uh, and this, this previous quarter already. So, you can help your family. So listen along as we go through this and see if you remember some of these things. Now, Jesus says here to not worry. 
I want you to think about that for just a moment. He says, don't worry in there in verse 25. But he says, for this reason. So this is the Sermon on the Mount, and he has been talking about the kingdom that is of God. And he's been talking about the kingdom citizens and what the kingdom citizen is to be like. And his whole point up to this moment here is that because the kingdom of God is so much greater, so far superior than anything else, that it deserves our full attention. And so when he says, for this reason, then, because of all that, because of the grandeur of this, of this kingdom of God, he then says, do not worry. Now, notice what he says. Do you realize that Jesus is giving us a direct command to not worry? Just as if he says, do not commit murder, he's saying, do not worry. Now, a lot of times, I think we want to downgrade what he's saying here to sort of like a suggestion. I say, well, you know, maybe he doesn't really mean that that much. And, and so we're, we're not really seeing how he is in direct opposition to that type of worrying mindset. And he gives us the reason there in verse 25. This overall reason why we're not to worry, he says, don't worry about the physical things because your life is more than just physical. We are spiritual beings, and we have so much more than just what we see here. We have greater pursuits that are spiritual in nature. And he says, your life is more than just food and drink and clothing. Now, it would be one thing if he just said that statement, if he just made that direct command and went on in his sermon, but he doesn't. He doesn't just leave us there, but he actually gives us arguments against worry. So let's look at this again there in verse 26. Notice he says, look at the birds of the air, that they do not sow, nor do they reap, nor do they gather into barns. And yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not worth much more than they? And who of you, by being worried, can add a single hour to his life? And why are you worried about clothing? Observe how the lilies of the field grow. They do not toil, nor do they spin. Yet I say to you that not even Solomon in all of his glory was clothed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass which is alive today and is thrown into the furnace tomorrow, will he not much more clothe you? you of little faith. Now, the first argument that he gives us here is this idea that we need to realize our value. Realize your value. And he gives us this example. Imagine all the people out there as he is proclaiming to the people on the hillside around the Sea of Galilee probably. And they're all looking, and he says, look at the birds of the sky. Look at all of the birds. And I, I want you to just imagine for a moment, not just one or two birds, but can you fathom all of the birds that are around this whole world right now? Jesus is saying God is taking care of them. They don't have to worry about, well, do I have enough? God is providing for them. They're out there gathering it and giving it to their young, as you see here in this picture. But here's the point that Jesus is making. If God does this for the birds, he says, you are the pinnacle of his creation. So he's drawing a comparison here to say, if this is the level of what he does for the birds, then how much greater will he do for you whom he values above all else? Now, Jesus emphasizes this twice because of its importance. He says, look, God gives the birds food. He provides for them. 
But then he goes on and he says, consider the lilies of the field and how they are dressed in such beauty, in such grandeur. And he says, even Solomon, as he was clothed in all of his royal and glorious arraignments, was not, can't even compare to these lilies of the field. But just think about that lily and how delicate it is. Back in the times of Jesus, all it would have taken was one step from a donkey or the slice of a sickle. And all those lilies are dead now. As he says, it's alive today, and then tomorrow it's thrown into the fire. But where did that beauty come from? It didn't come from the lily. It came from God. And so his point here is, how much greater then will he clothe us? Because we are his creation. The value that we have because we are our fathers. That's what he wants us to see. That's the reason why we should not worry because of that value. Now, he goes on and he gives us another example. And it's sort of tucked in there uh, in verse 27 when he says, and who of you by being worried can add a single hour to his life? So really he asks the question, what does worry really accomplish? Now, think about that. I mean, if you had to answer that question, what's the answer? Well, it's nothing. There is nothing that we can add to our lives. I can't worry and add one hour to my life. And we all understand that. But think about that. It's interesting over in Luke's account, uh, of this same idea where he says, who of you by worrying can add one single hour to his life? He then follows that up and says, if then you cannot do a very little thing, why do you worry about other matters? Now, think about that for just a moment. If you had the ability to add time to your life, to manipulate time, wouldn't you consider that a grand thing, a, a, an awesome thing? And yet what Jesus is saying here is, you can't even do a very little thing. So why are you worrying about all these other things? You see, worry doesn't accomplish anything for us. Now, I tried to illustrate this to the fourth and fifth grade class. Um, uh, uh, several weeks ago. So fourth and fifth graders, maybe you'll remember this. Uh, I brought in a huge water balloon. And I said, who doesn't want to get soaked? Now, this object lesson actually sort of backfired on me because all of the fourth and fifth graders were raising their hand. They were saying, yeah, 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 I want to get soaked. I want to get, I want to get drenched. But I picked one. I think I picked Alyssa Obsain. And so I had this huge water balloon. I was holding it with, with both hands. And I was standing on a chair above her. And I said, Alyssa, I want you to worry about getting soaked. I want you to just worry as much as you can. And I want you to see if that's going to stop you from getting soaked. Now, I didn't want Junior and Quina upset at me, so I didn't drop the balloon on Alyssa. I actually swapped it out, and I dumped uh, confetti on, on her. But I was trying to illustrate that point is it doesn't matter how much we worry about something. We can't change the outcome of that. And most of the time, what we worry about is stuff that's out of our control, stuff that in many ways, doesn't even come to fruition, doesn't even happen, but we worry about it. Well, what if this, or what if that? So he says, it's not gonna give you anything. It's not gonna accomplish anything. But he goes on and he gives another reason. And that reason is that you have 
Heavenly Father who knows your needs. Now, notice again, he says there in verse 31, do not worry then saying, what will we eat or what will we drink or what will we wear for clothing? For the Gentiles eagerly seek all these things. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. Now notice in this reason or this argument for not worrying, he again reiterates that same direct command, do not worry. But now he's drawing a contrast. And he's drawing this contrast between those who do not know God, those who have no relationship with God, and those who do know God, and those who experience his loving care. And so the contrast here is, here's the Gentiles, here's those who don't have a relationship with God, and their pursuit is all about this physical world. They are striving for it. They are going after the food, the clothing, the, the yachts, the four-wheelers, the on and on and on it goes. That's their pursuit. But here's what he says to that. He says, God knows your needs. He's not surprised that someone might lose their job. God's not caught off guard when a sickness comes upon you. He's not saying, oh, wait a minute, I didn't see that. I've got to, I gotta, I gotta get back in front of this. God already knows that. And he already knows what you need in every circumstance. And he has a plan to meet your needs. Because that's the next point that he says then, is he says. We need to see the greater priority. You see, we need to seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. And all these things will be added to us. And he goes on then to say, so do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will care for itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. You see, when he tells us that we are to seek his kingdom first, what that means is that we've got to stop thinking that our physical well-being is a worthy object to live for. Now, let me say that again, because I think a lot of times that goes into my head and goes right out the other ear. But what he's saying is that we need to stop thinking that our physical well-being is a worthy object to live for. Because once we understand that, once we understand that I'm not striving for this here and now, the physical, it opens me up to be able to see the value of the spiritual. Because he says, God will take care of your physical needs. God will help you. He will give you what you need. N.T. Wright says it this way. He says, put the world first, and you'll find it gets moth-eaten in your hands. Put God first, and you'll get the world thrown in. Now, think about what is being said there. That sometimes we grab hold of this world thinking that that's what, that's what we want, that's what we need. But he says if we release it, God will provide for us. And it says there that God will give us our needs, not our wants. Those are two different things. God will provide the things that are of necessity for us in our life. And God will actually go above and beyond that. But what that means is that it comes down to a matter of trust. That's really what faith is. When I have trust in my God, that he is going to take care of what is happening in my life, and that, I, and that I'm putting my trust in him, not in myself. You see, that's sort of hard these past few weeks, because this is really the testing ground of our faith. 
we talk about faith a lot when we get together, when we have, and we have Bible studies on it. We, we talk about, you know, building our faith. Well, right now is the reason why we do that. Because in the midst of all of this uncertainty, it's a matter of where am I going to put my trust? Am I going to be worrying about this and that and, and all of these things? Or am I going to say, no, no, I'm not because God is in control. I'm going to put my trust in him. And so he says, don't dwell on what hasn't even happened yet. Don't dwell on tomorrow because there will be enough troubles tomorrow. But just focus on today. Focus on what you can do in the moment rather than worrying about what's going to happen in the future. Now, think about it because he says all of this in the Sermon on the Mount. And that would be one thing for us. We go, okay, yeah, Jesus, yeah, I'm not supposed to worry. But I think all of us would still probably be closet worriers. And then maybe we don't tell anybody about our worries or our anxieties, but deep down, we would still have them, even though he tells us, do not worry. So let's think about what happens when I worry. Now, while Jesus commands us to not worry, God is still recognizing that he understands we wrestle with the uncertainties of this life. And he knows that we are still going to have anxieties. So the question is, how do we deal with those anxieties that we have? How do we deal with the worries that we have? Do we hold on to them? Do we focus upon them such that they consume our everyday life? Or do we do something with them? You see, we're told in 1 Peter chapter 5 that we are to do something with our anxieties. So turn over in your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 5. 1 Peter chapter 5, and beginning there in verse 6, there Peter writes, Therefore, Humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you at the proper time, casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. Now, when we think about the passage there, that's telling us something about what we do with our worries, with our anxieties. And he tells us there to cast them upon him. So let's sort of break that, that, those verses down for just a moment. Because the very first thing that he tells us to do is he says, humble yourself under God, under the mighty hand of God. You see, true humility is the realization that we are not in control. And that we are letting go of those worries and of the anxieties that we feel. And we're giving them over to the one who is in control. But understand what he's saying there. Have you ever thought about that? That holding on to your worries is a sense of pride. You say, well, how in the world could that be? I mean, that's, I, I, I'm not saying look at me or anything. But think about what we're doing there. When we know there is one who is in all control, and we don't give over our worries to him, what are we doing? We're saying, God, you can't handle my situation. And so I need to dwell on it. I need to worry over it. I need to, to get stressed out over this situation that may or may not come to pass. That's a sense of pride. And so what he says for us is that we must humble ourselves. And the way that we humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God is that we cast our anxieties upon him. Now, notice what he says there with that idea of cast. Notice he doesn't say, lay down your anxieties before God. He 
he says the word cast. And that's actually, at least it brings to me the idea of throwing out a fishing net. And when you think about throwing out a fishing net, you're, you're, you're casting it or you're throwing it away from yourself. And that's the idea of that word cast there. Get these anxieties away from you. So all the troubles, all the fears that you may have, all the hurt, all the feelings of I don't have any strength, all the feelings of I'm about to be crushed under this burden that I am bearing right now. He says, take all of those. And he says, cast them upon him. All the things that we are unable to handle. All the things that we throw up, that we, we, we burden ourselves with. He says, give it over to God. Because he is so much stronger than we can possibly imagine. I couldn't find a picture of what I wanted here, but I want you to imagine just this massive wheelbarrow. One that is just, one that is so big that it could block out the sunlight, okay? I mean, that's how big we're talking about. And I want you to imagine then that you've got all of your burdens, all your worries, all your anxieties, and that you are then putting them in this wheelbarrow that is God's wheelbarrow. And that he can take all of my worries and your worries and we can pile them in this wheelbarrow and it doesn't phase him. He can pick it right up and keep on moving. You see, that's our perspective from it. What I see is God's perspective is all of those burdens and worries are like a piece of fuzz. Have you ever had a piece of fuzz land on you? I mean, you don't even know that it's there, right? That's the same idea that God is so strong. He is so mighty that it doesn't matter how many worries and burdens we have. He says, put them on him. Put them on my shoulders because I can handle them. Now notice the last part that he says here. He says, give it all to him, all your anxieties over to God. Because that's actually what Psalm I think what Peter's pulling from is Psalm 55 and verse 22, where it says, cast your burden upon the Lord and he will sustain you. He will never allow the righteous to be shaken. Another word for that is to totter or teeter. He's never, he's not going to leave us to where we are on our own. Well, what, what's the reason for that? Well, he tells us there, he says, because he cares for you. God concerns himself with the things that concern us. Now think about that. A lot of times we think God's way up here and, and he's, he's, he's concerned about so many other grand things that he doesn't, he doesn't have time for my insignificance. But that's not what this verse is saying here. God is concerned with all of the things that we think about. Adam Clark said it this way. He said, whatever things concern a follower of God, whether they be spiritual or temporal, or whether in themselves great or small, God concerns himself with them. What affects them affects him. In all their afflictions, he is afflicted. He who knows that God cares for him need have no anxious cares about himself. Sometimes we would do really well to hold on to that and remember that. That God cares for us. I think about a father and he goes into his child's room at night and he searches for all the monsters that are in the closet or under the bed. The father's concerned about the child. Even the, 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 what the father may look at and say, you know, he could take the, the other stance of, kid, there are no monsters, get over it. But he doesn't. 
He's concerned about his child. And so he goes in and he looks up underneath the covers and he pulls open the doors in the closet to say, I'm searching for the monsters such that the kid can go to sleep. The father's concerned about the needs of the child. Just in the same way, God is concerned about your needs. He's concerned about the things that you're worrying about, even right now. You see, when we really get down to it, here's the answer. There is no justified anxiety. We will have them. We will have worries. But we can't justify it in saying, well, it's okay to do this. He's given us a path such that we can let it go and give it over to him. And when we do that, we find that we have freed ourselves up for the spiritual pursuits that truly matter. That of a relationship with God, our Father. I want us to now sort of bring all of this message to a close just with a quick prayer. But here's what I want you to do. As I pray, I want you to think about all of the things that you're anxious about right now. I want you to think about all the worries. Kids, I want you to do the same. If you've got any worries right now, I want you to, to think about that. And I want you to, to visualize that you have it in your hand and that you are then putting it into God's huge wheelbarrow and you're giving it up so that he can take it and bear it for you. So let's pray together. Our almighty God, we come humbly before you and we thank you for your love and your care. And Father, you have told us that we are to not be anxious for anything, but that we are to, in everything, come in prayer and supplication and thanksgiving before you. And so that's what we are doing right now. And we are making our request known to you. Father, we want to give you all of our worries, all of the things that have been upon our hearts, even this past week, whether it be things with this virus, things that are going on with our families, things that, that we just maybe are worrying about that may not even come about. Father, we are giving these things over to you. And we are asking that as we do that, that you will then give us your peace. The peace that Paul tells us in Philippians 4 that goes beyond understanding. Father, we, we, we ask for that. We want that. And we ask that that then will guard our hearts and our minds as we seek to serve our risen King, Jesus Christ. Take our worries, take our anxieties, Father, and you deal with them rather than us living with them. All of this we ask through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen.